Part four, chapter ten of Gulliver's Travels. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lizzie Driver. Gulliver's Travels by Jonathan Swift. Part four, a voyage to the country of the Huynhams. Chapter ten. The author's economy and happy life among the Huynhams, his great improvement in virtue by conversing with them, their conversations. The author has notice given him by his master that he must depart from the country. He falls into a swoon for grief, but submits. He contrives and finishes a canoe by the help of a fellow servant, and puts to sea at a venture. I had settled my little economy to my own heart's content. My master had ordered a room to be made for me, after their manner, about six yards from the house, the sides and floors of which I plastered with clay, and covered with rush mats of my own contriving. I had beaten hemp, which there grows wild, and made of it a sort of tickling. This I filled with the feathers of several birds I had taken with springs made of Yahoo's hairs and were excellent food. I had worked two chairs with my knife, the sorrel nag helping me in the grosser and more laborious part. When my clothes were worn to rags, I made myself others with the skins of rabbits, and of a certain beautiful animal, about the same size, called Nahono, the skin of which is covered with a fine down. Of these I also made very tolerable stockings. I sold my shoes with wood, which I cut from a tree, and fitted to the upper leather, and when this was worn out, I supplied it with the skins of yahoos dried in the sun. I often got honey out of hollow trees, which I mingled with water or ate with my bread. No man could more verify the truth of these two maxims, that nature is very easily satisfied, and that necessity is the mother of invention. I enjoyed perfect health of body and tranquillity of mind. I did not feel the treachery or inconsistency of a friend, nor the injuries of a secret or open enemy. I had no occasion of bribing, flattering, or pimping, to procure the favour of any great man or his minion. I wanted no fence against fraud or oppression. Here was neither physician to destroy my body, nor lawyer to ruin my fortune, no informer to watch my words and actions or forge accusations against me for hire. Here were no gibers, censures, backbiters, pickpockets, highwaymen, housebreakers, attorneys, boards, buffoons, gamesters, politicians, wits, splenetics, tedious talkers, controvertists, ravishers, murderers, robbers, virtuosos, no leaders or followers of party and faction, no encouragers to vice by seducement or examples, no dungeon, axes, gibbets, whipping-posts, or pillories, no cheating shopkeepers or merchants, no pride, vanity, or affectation, no fops, bullies, drunkards, strolling whores, or poxes, no ranting, lewd, expensive wives, no stupid, proud pedants, no importunate, overbearing, quarrelsome, noisy, roaring, empty, conceited, swearing companions. No scoundrels raised from the dust upon the merit of their vices, or nobility thrown into it on account of their virtues. No lords, fiddlers, judges, or dancing-masters. I had the favour of being admitted to several Whinhams, who came to visit or dine with my master, where his honour graciously suffered me to wait in the room and listen to their discourse. Both he and his company would often descend to ask me questions, and receive my answers. I had also sometimes the honour of attending my master in his visits to others. I never presumed to speak, except in answer to a question, and then I did it with inward regret, because it was a loss of so much time for improving myself. But I was infinitely delighted with the situation of a humble auditor in such conversations where nothing passed but what was useful, expressed in the fewest and most significant words. Where, as I have already said, the greatest decency was observed, without the least degree of ceremony. 
where no person spoke without being pleased himself and pleasing his companions, where there was no interruption, tediousness, heat, or difference of sentiments. They have a notion that, when people are met together, a short silence does much improve the conversation. This I found to be true, for, during those little intermissions of talk, new ideas would arise in their minds, which very much enlivened the discourse. Their subjects are generally on friendship and benevolence, on order and economy, sometimes upon the visible operations of nature, or ancient traditions, upon the bounds and limits of virtue, upon the unerring rules of reason, or upon some determinations to be taken at the next general assembly, and often upon the various excellences of poetry. I may add, without vanity, that my presence often gave them sufficient matter for discourse, because it afforded my master an occasion of letting his friends into the history of me and my country, upon which they were all pleased to discount, in a manner not very advantageous to humankind, and for that reason I shall not repeat what they said, only I may be allowed to observe that his honour, to my great admiration, appeared to understand the nature of yahoos much better than myself. He went through all our vices and follies, and discovered many which I had never mentioned to him, by only supposing what qualities a yahoo of their country, with a small proportion of reason, might be capable of exerting, and concluded, with too much probability, how vile as well as miserable such a creature must be. I freely confess that all the little knowledge I have of any value was acquired by the lectures I received from my master, and from hearing the discourse of him and his friends, to which I should be prouder to listen than to dictate to the greatest and wisest assembly in Europe. I admired the strength, comeliness, and speed of the inhabitants, and such a constellation of virtues in such admirable persons produced in me the highest veneration. At first, indeed, I did not feel the natural awe which the yahoos and all other animals bear toward them, but it grew upon me by decrees much sooner than I imagined, and was mingled with respectful love and gratitude that they would condescend to distinguish me from the rest of my species. All the human race in general, I considered them, as they really were, yahoos in shape and disposition, perhaps a little more civilized and qualified with the gift of speech, but making no other use of reason than to improve and multiply those vices whereof their brethren in this country had only the share that nature allotted them. When I happened to behold the reflection of my own form in a lake or fountain, I turned away my face in horror and detestation of myself, and could better endure the sight of a common yahoo than of my own person. By conversing with the Huinans and looking upon them with delight, I fell to imitate their gait and gesture, which is now grown into a habit, and my friends often tell me, in a blunt way, that I trot like a horse, which, however, I take for a great compliment. Neither shall I disown that in speaking I am apt to fall into the voice and manner of the Huinams, and hear myself ridiculed on that account without the least mortification. In the midst of all this happiness, and when I looked upon myself to be fully settled for life, my master sent for me one morning a little earlier than his usual hour. I observed by his countenance that he was in some perplexity, and at a loss how to begin what he had to speak. After a short silence he told me, he did not know how I would take what he was going to say, that in the last general assembly, when the affair of the yahoos was entered upon, the representatives had taken offence at his keeping a yahoo, meaning myself, in his family, more like a whinam than a brute animal, that he was known frequently to converse with me, as if he could receive some advantage or pleasure in my company, that such a practice was not agreeable to reason or nature, or a thing ever heard of before among them. The assembly did therefore exhort him either to employ me like the rest of my species, or command me to swim back to the place whence I came. That the first of these expedients 
was utterly rejected by all the Houyhnhnms who had ever seen me at his house or their own, for they alleged that because I had some rudiments of reason, added to the natural pravity of those animals, it was to be feared I might be able to seduce them into the woody and mountainous parts of the country, and bring them in troops by night to destroy the Houyhnhnms' cattle, as being naturally of the ravenous kind and averse from labour. My master added that he was daily pressed by the Houyhnhnms of the neighbourhood to have the assembly's exhortation executed, which he could not put off much longer. He doubted it would be impossible for me to swim to another country, and therefore wished I would contrive some sort of vehicle, resembling those I had described to him, that might carry me on the sea, in which work I should have the assistance of his own servants, as well as those of his neighbours. He concluded that, for his own part, he could have been content to keep me in his service as long as I lived, because he found I had cured myself of some bad habits and dispositions, by endeavouring, as far as my inferior nature was capable, to imitate the Houyhnhnms. I should here observe to the reader that a decree of the General Assembly in this country, expressed by the word Hun Holnyayan, which signifies an exhortation as near as I can render it, for they have no conception how a rational creature can be compelled, but only advised or exhorted, because no person can disobey reason without giving up his claim to be a rational creature. I was struck with the utmost grief and despair at my master's discourse, and being unable to support the agonies I was under, I fell into a swoon at his feet. When I came to myself, he told me that he concluded I had been dead, for these people are subject to no such imbecilities of nature. I answered in a faint voice that death would have been too great a happiness, that, although I could not blame the assembly's exhortation, or the urgency of his friends, yet, in my weak and corrupt judgment, I thought it might consist with reason to have been less rigorous, that I could not swim a league, and probably the nearest land to theirs might be a distance above a hundred, that many materials, necessary for making a small vessel to carry me off, were wholly wanting in this country, which, however, I would attempt, in obedience and gratitude to his honour, although I concluded the thing to be impossible, and therefore looked on myself as already devoted to destruction, that the certain prospect of an unnatural death was the least of my evils. For supposing I should escape with my life by some strange adventure, how could I think with temper of passing my days among yahoos, and relapsing into my old corruptions, for want of examples to lead and keep me within the paths of virtue? that I knew too well upon what solid reasons all the determinations of the wise Houyhnhnms were founded, not to be shaken by arguments of mine, a miserable Yahoo. And therefore, after presenting him with my humble thanks for the offer of his servant's assistance in making a vessel, and desiring a reasonable time for so difficult a work, I told him I would endeavour to preserve a wretched being, and, if I ever returned to England, was not without hopes of being useful to my own species, by celebrating the praises of the renowned Houyhnhnms, and proposing their virtues to the imitation of mankind. My master, in a few words, made me a very gracious reply, allowed me the space of two months to finish my boat, and ordered the sorrel nag, my fellow-servant, for so at this distance I may presume to call him, to follow my instruction, because I told my master that his help would be sufficient, and I knew he had a tenderness for me. In his company my first business was to go to that part of the coast where my rebellious crew had ordered me to be set on shore. I got upon a height, and looking on every side into the sea, fancied I saw a small island towards the northeast. I took out my pocket-glass, and could then clearly distinguish it above five leagues off, as I computed but it appeared to the sorrel nag to be only a blue cloud, for as he had no conception of any country beside his own, so he could not be expected in distinguishing remote objects at sea, as we who so much converse in that element. After I had discovered this island, I considered no further, but resolved it should, if possible, 
be the first place of my banishment, leaving the consequence to fortune. I returned home, and, consulting with a sorrel nag, we went into a copse at some distance, where I, with my knife, and he with a sharp flint, fastened very artificially after their manner to a wooden handle, cut down several oak wattles, about the thickness of a walking-staff, and some larger pieces. But I shall not trouble the reader with a particular description of my own mechanics. Let it suffice to say, that in six weeks' time, with the help of the sorrel nag, who performed the parts that required most labour, I finished a sort of Indian canoe, but much larger, covering it with the skins of yahoos, well stitched together with hempen threads of my own making. My sail was likewise composed of the skins of the same animal, but I made use of the youngest I could get, the older being too tough and thick, and I likewise provided myself with four paddles. I laid in a stock of boiled flesh, of rabbits and fowls, and took with me two vessels, one filled with milk and the other with water. I tried my canoe in a large pond near my master's house, and then corrected in it what was amiss. "'stopping all the chinks with Yahoo's tallow, "'till I found it staunch, "'and able to bear me and my freight. "'And, when it was as complete as I could make it, "'I had it drawn on a carriage very gently by Yahoo's to the seaside, "'under the conduct of the sorrel nag and another servant. "'When I was ready, and the day came for my departure, "'I took leave of my master and lady and the whole family.' my eyes flowing with tears, and my heart quite sunk with grief. But his honour, out of curiosity, and perhaps, if I may speak without vanity, partly out of kindness, was determined to see me in my canoe, and got several of his neighbouring friends to accompany him. I was forced to wait above an hour for the tide, and then, observing the wind very fortunately bearing towards the island, to which I intended to steer my course, I took a second leave of my master. But, as I was going to prostrate myself to kiss his hoof, he did me the honour to raise it gently to my mouth. I am not ignorant how much I have been censured for mentioning this last particular. Detractors are pleased to think it improbable that so illustrious a person should descend to give so great a mark of distinction to a creature so inferior as I. Neither have I forgotten how apt some travellers are to boast of extraordinary favours they have received. But if these censures were better acquainted with the noble and courteous dispositions of the Huynhams, they would soon change their opinion. I paid my respects to the rest of the Huynhams in his honour's company. Then, getting into my canoe, I pushed off from shore. End of part four, chapter ten.